What's going on guys? I'm Tyler, and in continuing my series of 2D DreamWorks reviews, I'm here to let you know that Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, is no perfect movie. And this movie, of course, follows a wild horse who, for various circumstances, finds himself captive to both the U.S. Cavalry and the Lakota tribe during the First Nation Wars. And without really much choice, this horse spirit is forced to fight for his own independence and decide whether or not he can really trust human beings in general. Even if you've never seen this movie, just hearing about it, you already know the distinguishing thing about it. Even though the main character is a horse, none of the animals in this movie speak. The most we ever get are these inner monologues by Matt Damon that give you the, give you the bare essentials, but those inner monologues are really only one to two sentences at best. The majority of this movie has these characters communicating through their neighing, through their facial expressions, and their body language, and telling a visual story from the perspective of an animal on all fours from two animators who were making their directorial debut with this movie, that is a really tough thing to accomplish. They apparently spent four years just animating this movie, but you know what? The effort really goes to show, and the effort almost looks easy, and that's the greatest thing I can say about this movie. Any movie that tries to tell its story visually, if it looks easy, it absolutely wasn't. I said in my Reluctant Dragon review that there was a live elephant at Disney Studios for animators to, like, draw and reference while they were making Dumbo. Turns out it's a completely normal practice for studios to do decades later, because DreamWorks actu actually purchased a stallion named Donner for the animators to draw and reference and videotape as it was walking and sprinting because apparently horses are one of the toughest animals for animators to draw not just because they're on all fours which is like four legs means more legs to animate but horses have much different anatomy than most animals their eyes are on the sides of their head and so far away from their jaw so it's really hard to tell what their emotions are just by looking at them in real life. So the animators obviously had to exaggerate certain features. For example, in this movie, horses' eyes are at the front of their head, much closer to their jaws. Their eyes have much more white scleras, so that you can really understand what this character is thinking without speaking. They have much bigger eyebrows that are much more expressive. They have much more human smiles. I know horses can smile, but um, they really shouldn't. In any case, the combination of realistic horse anatomy with human facial expressions was really key in nailing just how, just how well fleshed out these characters are without even talking. And the sound design is also very crucial to this movie, and I don't think that many reviews really point that out. It's a... It's a filmmaking technique that really slips under the radar with most people, but in this movie, because these horses, at best, speak through horse neighing, through whining, through galloping and sprinting, that's a lot to accomplish. And you would think most movies would hire voiceover actors to basically do the sound effects, but in this case, they thought it would sound unrealistic or too phony, so the sound designer, Tim Chow, hopefully I said that right, spent a year and a half at horse stables to record just as many authentic expressions, just as many grunts, sips of water at very best, and of course neighing and whining, at different, different levels of tone, different levels of volume, because each emotion of a horse for this movie has to sound completely different. Because I think that's something that people don't really think about when they talk about this movie. They just talk about the fact that the horses don't talk, but you still understand what they're going through. They don't really point out that even in the most dire situations, horses do make sounds. And based on the exact tones that Spirit and the other horses give, say a lot about them in the given moment. If he's just looking at you with this evil glare and saying absolutely nothing, sure, that sells a lot. But when he's protesting the U.S. Cavalry, when he's trying to get every single rider off his back because he refuses to be broken down, he grunts, he howls at like the highest pitches. And that adds so much to the tension, so much to what this character is going through at a given moment. But judging the story and the characters just based on their writing, it's insane how 
fleshed out all of these characters are with very little talking. Spirit himself is a pretty likable character simply because of his bravery. He would do anything to protect an innocent animal from danger, even if it means walking into a situation that he has absolutely no idea what it is, or even if he'll come out of it alive. But the thing that really surprised me about his central arc was it's basically an arc about him becoming a much more tolerant creature, which really shouldn't come as a surprise. I mean, the movie's about the conflict between U.S. cavalry and the Lakota tribe, but what I wasn't really expecting was Spirit to be kind of a bigot towards human beings, but it still kind of makes sense because he's captured against his will by both of these groups. Of course he's going to be rebellious to humans. Of course he's going to be judgmental to the other horses in the Lakota tribe who have no bounds like he does, but they choose to stick around with this tribe and become integrated with them. And like any racist or bigoted person, he's absolutely confused. He doesn't understand the situation, but he doesn't want to learn about the situation because to him, it just looks horrible. It looks like it goes against everything he was raised by. It isn't until he meets this painted mare named Rain, who is also a really likable character, that she shows him around the tribe. She shows him the level of kindness and compassion that humans are capable of. And what's great about this is that Spirit is willing to listen to her. He's willing to show more respect towards Little Creek if he is able to give so a certain level of compassion back to him. And you know what? I actually do really like the romance between Spirit and Rain. Sometimes it can be a little melodramatic, and if this movie did have dialogue, I'd probably hate the romance because of that, but... The two of them really have a lot of things in common. They're both stubborn individuals, but incredibly loyal to their loved ones. They're both incredibly curious about different things. Spirit eventually becomes curious about the tribe. Rain becomes more curious about what it would be like to live as a wild horse. And just because it is a visual romance, there aren't cer any certain romantic cliches that I would absolutely hate in any other movie. One would think that because so much time is devoted to these animals who don't speak, you would think that whenever there are scenes primarily human-focused that they would be heavy on the dialogue. But no, the human characters are also characters of few words, and that lends a lot of mystery to them as people. The human that probably sticks out the most is James Cromwell as this colonel who... They don't flat out say it, but I mean, come on, it's, it's Colonel Custer without question. But in any case, his design and Cromwell's kind of unrecognizable voice, I wouldn't have been able to guess that it was him, makes him seem so calm and collective even at his most, even with his most inner rage whenever he's embarrassed by Spirit because Spirit is the one horse who refuses to be broken in by him which really matters to him because he's trying to use Spirit as an example of, hey, if we can break in any horse, we can break in any native and take over their land. I'll be honest, at first I wasn't like super into Little Creek. I thought he was kind of a blank slate. I didn't think there was that much left to him, up, at least left up to interpretation, but then I started thinking about it and I realized there actually were some subtle clues. They say that he's a teenage boy, but you never see his parents, which... If you've seen that many kids' movies, just pretend like you don't know what that means. And even though he does have human friends in his tribe who he interacts with, he spends a lot more time with Spirit and Rain, so you kind of get the sense that he's more, he's more devoted to training animals and building bonds with them because those bonds are very unique. And I'm just realizing this as I'm making this video, but for a movie about the U.S. cavalry taking over native territory... There is a little bit of an allegory about Native Americans taking animals like horses, taking them into their tribe against their will. And sure, it's based on compassion and they treat them with respect. But at one point, Little Creek does realize, based on how many times Spirit refuses to be broken in, that he is kind of taking away Spirit's free choice and is questioning whether or not he did the exact same thing to Rain, whether or not she willingly wanted to be his riding partner in the first place. Now as for problems, I felt like they focused a little too much on the U.S. Cavalry being the villains of the central story as opposed to focusing on the Lakota tribe. What exactly 
what exactly their culture was, what their religious or ethical beliefs were. You don't really... There aren't even that many Lakota characters other than Little Creek. He has a couple friends, but they have like one or two lines of talking, and that's it. And it doesn't even set up them as characters. They're just the best friends, and that's about it. Which is a little weird, because the writer of this movie, John Fusco, I hope I said that right, he's a writer who loves to delve into other cultures. He's direct. He's written a lot of westerns like Young Guns. He's done martial arts stuff like Forbidden Kingdom and Marco Polo. He likes the idea of having characters of different backgrounds interacting with each other, which is great, and you can tell that in this movie. And as much as people have complained that it makes the native tribes completely innocent of everything, like they've never done anything guilty versus the white cavalry who do almost nothing but horrible misdeeds, I will admit it is a little unfair and unbalanced in regards to realistically what happened in history it's a pocahontas thing where movies aren't lectures and they shouldn't be but i felt like you could have added a little more realism that would have made it more questionable it would have given kids something to think about in terms of history maybe ask their parents what really happened and then the parents and the kids could look it up on the internet maybe learn new things together stuff like that I wouldn't say white men are like a hundred percent evil in this movie because as ruthless as the colonel was there are a couple scenes towards the end where he actually does show a compassionate and dignified side, and that was something that I wasn't really expecting. You would think all those things would be my main problem, but my main problem actually delves with the music. Not the overall score itself. Hans Zimmer has another great score. Just add that to another list of great career accomplishments. My problem stems from the songs, which are there to kind of narrate what's going on during the montages. I'm just gonna flat out say it. They ripped off like the Phil Collins songs from Tarzan and Brother Bear because they were like in the middle of production as Tarzan came out. So it's not, it seems like too big of a coincidence. Instead of Phil Collins, they hired Brian Adams to write and sing the songs. And the, song them, the songs themselves are fine, but I don't really remember them. The only one I can remember right off the bat was called Get Off My Back, and I kind of remember that just because it's the montage where Spirit is fighting for his freedom against the cavalry. They want to break him in, they want to brand him, and he refuses and resists at every conceivable opportunity he can get. It's the scenes themselves that I remember as opposed to the music, and whenever the songs are like explicitly explaining what's happening in the scene, it just felt lazy. It felt like they weren't giving us that much faith to understand what was going on, even though this is a movie that is visual storytelling. So I felt like the songs as a storytelling technique were kind of conflicting with the overall style of the movie. But that's really about it. Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron is the first big surprise in this four movie series. I hope that keeps going because I've heard so many things about El Dorado and Prince of Egypt being really underrated. I actually haven't seen either, but now I'm very much looking forward to it. The The whole idea of telling this story for kids through visuals is commendable enough on its own, but they pulled it off so flawlessly. The animation on the animals, on the Western backgrounds, it all looks stunning. It looks bright, colorful, fast and fluid. Matt Damon as a narrator was actually pretty decent. He didn't overshadow what was going on in the scene. He sounded a little, a little exaggerated sometimes. And I've heard like some of the other possible narrators like Robert Redford. I probably would have preferred that. But as is, Matt Damon was still pretty good. And the characters themselves, even with little dialogue, just through communicating through animal noises, it leads to some really fleshed out and very likable characters. And there's not much I can say other than I love this movie. I actually teared up a little bit at the end because it felt like it felt like such an emotional journey, not an unpredictable journey by any means, but an emotional one. And that's because the animators, the writers, Hans Zimmer, they all did a really good job. And for that reason, I'm going to give Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron a four out of five. Guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen Spirit, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Be sure to stay tuned for more DreamWorks reviews and for more 
reviews of movies that I missed the chance to talk about in 2019. So regardless, be sure to stay tuned for more content and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.